I'll start my uh, last, uh, last lecture and the last lecture for the day. Um, I cannot thank you enough for having sat through all of this uh, agony. Um, and uh, I will try to make it short and sweet. Um, I want to first explain to you what I uh, understand um, by the problem of social, of social order. Um, imagine Robinson Crusoe alone on his island. Um, there we have no problem of social order. Robinson Crusoe can do whatever he wants to do. Um, no question arises what is right, is what is wrong, and so forth. Um, now assume that we have a second person and then a problem of social order does arise. So Friday appears on the island um, and uh, let's assume for a moment that this island is the Garden of Eden, um, with which of course we are all familiar. Um, and uh, in this Garden of Eden there exists a superabundance of, of all goods. Um, and insofar as there exists a superabundance of goods, it is not conceivable that Robinson Crusoe and Friday could get in a conflict with each other. Whenever I eat a banana, um, there's still plenty of bananas left over for me tomorrow, and there's nothing really uh, taken away from Friday either because there is a superabundance of bananas. He has as many bananas as he wants. So there would be no possibility that we could fight over bananas uh, or coconuts or whatever it is that, um, that we desire. As long as a superabundance of goods exist, conflicts over such goods are impossible. There exists, however, even in the Garden of Eden, a scarcity with regard to two things. Um, the first is our physical bodies. Um, I have only one. Crusoe has only one. Friday has only one. I do not have a superabundance of bodies. So if uh, Friday wants to do something to the body of Crusoe or Crusoe wants to do something to the, bo to the body of um, Friday, th there is a conflict between them. Um, a conflict over scarce resources. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, what is scarce is our standing room. Um, whatever place I occupy, cannot be at the same time occupied by Friday. So we can also have a conflict over who can stand at what place. Um, the problem of social order is then uh, to develop rules that make it possible that otherwise unavoidable conflict can conceivably be avoided. Um, and the way to do this is through rules of property. Rules of property being rules that regulate who and who not should have exclusive control over scarce resources. Um, so that conflicts um, can be avoided. Now what rules would be accepted in the Garden of Eden without going into a great explanation why is intuitively plausible. And I'll give some more elaborate justifications for that as we go along but at the moment it's entirely sufficient to just appeal to intuition. Um, so in the Garden of Eden the rules that uh, uh, Friday and Crusoe most likely would accept is um, you Crusoe own your own body 
and you Friday own your body, you can do with your body whatever you, you want, I can do with my body whatever I want. Um, only if I invite you can you do something to my body, but if I don't invite you, uh, then not. And as far as a standing room rule is concerned, um, what would be intuitively accepted would be you can move around wherever you want um, as long as nobody else is already occupying the place that you want to occupy. As soon as he moves away, you, you can move to the same place. Um, if they would follow these rules, the two guys, then all conflicts could be uh, conceivably avoided. So now we leave the Garden of Eden and enter the real world and the only distinction between the real world and the Garden of Eden is the fact that uh, in the real world we have scarcity of lots of things. Um, and um, accordingly we can have conflicts over lots of things except just our physical bodies plus our standing room. And again, the object um, uh, of social order is to formulate rules of exclusive control, property rules, that assign exclusive control over some scares to one individual rather than another individual in order to make it possible that they can possibly avoid conflict that otherwise would have to arise due to the fact that there is no rule that regulates who exclusively controls this and who exclusively controls something else. Now let me give you first the rules that I think would likely be accepted and then give you a justification um, for these rules. Um, these rules, by the way, are not rules that uh, I have drawn out of my hat. Um, these are rules that you find basically uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, literature of uh, political philosophy almost from, from the very beginning on uh, in Aristotle and the more recent formulations given to it by John Locke and uh, authors in the, in the present. Um, as well. So these are very old rules and just a brief explanation. The first one is just a rule that I already mentioned as also uh, likely accepted in the Garden of Eden. Every person has exclusive control over his own physical body and only at invitation are other people allowed to do something to my physical body or to do something to your physical body. Um, the second rule concerns how do we acquire property that is the right to exclusively control uh, in resource, in scarce resources that were previously unowned, uh, for which there existed no previous owner. And there the rule is simply um, he who puts previously unowned resources for the first time to some use, um, does something with them, will thereby become the owner of these resources. This is also called original appropriation because original because it had not been appropriated before. Nobody owned it before. The second, the third rule follows from the first two. Um, that is, he who uses his physical body and <coughs> scarce resources that he originally appropriated and then transforms nature into something that he considers to be more valuable. Producing means nothing else but transforming something that is less valuable into something that is considered to be more valuable. He who produces something with originally appropriated goods becomes thereby the owner of what he has produced. And finally, um, property 
the right to exclusively control scarce resources can also be acquired by a voluntary transfer from someone who was the previous owner of these things to a later owner. Okay. Those are um, by and large also the rules that people do follow in their um, in their daily um, in their daily life. Let me just, uh, from an intuitive point of view here, just uh, make the point: that even little children, for instance, adhere to this to this rule. Uh, whenever they fight over toys or so, their standard argument is, of course, you know, I played with the toy first. Um, and uh, only if I drop the toy, then you are permitted to maybe play with the toy. But as long as I'm playing with it, uh, I'm the one who is, um, who is on control. Um, now to a justification of these rules. Um, and I want to choose two approaches to justify these rules. Um, the first approach is by simply denying them and showing what's wrong with the opposite of these rules. Now, we can think of one opposite to the first rule, and that would be a system of slavery. Instead of everyone being the owner of his own body, we can, of course, imagine a system where I'm the owner of your body, but you are not the owner of my body. That's one alternative. Now, what's wrong with the system of slavery? The standard argument against slavery is that uh, all ethical rule, all rules that aspire to be ethical rules must be universalizable. That is to say, they must apply to everyone in the same in the same way. Uh, another way to say the same thing is uh, ethical rules have to, um, have to fulfill the requirement of the so-called golden rule of ethics. That is to say, what you do not want to be done unto you, don't do unto others. Um, and here we have a system that does not fulfills the universalization criterion. We have, in fact, two sets of rules. One set for the slave masters, uh, or the Übermensch, and one set of rules for the slaves, or the Untermensch. Um, that, by definition, does not qualify as an ethic. Um, the slave would never possibly agree to such a, such a system as a fair, um, as a fair system of, uh, uh, of social order. And the second alternative we might call uh, universal communism. Now, this is the idea that I own a 40th part of you, and you own a 40th part of me. Um, you realize that this rule does fulfill the universalization criterion, because we do not make any distinction. The same right applies, so to speak, to all of, all of us. We are treated, indeed, equally. Um, However, this problem has even more severe, uh, this solution has even more severe problems than the first one. Uh, slavery, at least, we can put into effect. As a matter of fact, we know slavery has existed for long periods in history and still exists at some places. Um, but a system of universal communism cannot even be implemented for the following reason. Let's say I want to step from here to here. Am I allowed to do this? The answer is, of course, no. Because, after all, I only own a 40th of myself. Um, so what would be necessary for me in order to make a step like this? Um, the permission of all of you who are my co-owners. Um, 
But then the problem only begins because what is necessary for you to give me permission? Um, well, yeah, what is as minimum necessary is that you say, yes, Hoppe, you can do this. But uh, are you permitted to say, yes, Hoppe, you can do this? And the answer is, of course, no, you are not permitted to say that because you only own a 40th of your vocal cords. Um, so you could not open the mouth without having my permission, but I cannot give you permission either because I am only a 40th owner of my own vocal cords myself. So this would lead to a situation where we all would have to just stand, never do anything and die out. Um, obviously, any type of ethic, any type of legal system must be a legal system that allows humans to survive. Uh, this system does not even qualify as that, so we can forget that. Those are the only two alternatives that we have to this rule. We are stuck with this one. Let's take this one also. I don't have to go through these because these basically follow from the first two. Um, so there we can imagine again um, as an alternative it would not be um, the, first, um, the first user who um, becomes the owner of something, but, uh, but somebody later um, who becomes the owner of this. Um, what is the problem with this rule? Uh, now, this rule is also deadly because if the first owner is not allowed to appropriate something, the f nobody can be the first owner, then the second one would become the first owner. He also could not acquire it. Then the third one would, so to speak, become the next first one, but he also could not acquire it. Um, and we would again have a situation where mankind would uh, immediately uh, immediately die out. Um, the other alternative would be um, that um, instead of um, uh, instead of the uh, uh, first uh, uh, first owner uh, using uh, becoming first user becoming uh, the owner of it, we have again a universal communism. That is, it is again owned by everyone regardless of who was the first one. Um, but then we ha are basically back at, uh, at square one. What do we do then if all these co-owners of the originally appropriated goods do not as if by magic agree what should be done with it? Uh, and of course they don't agree what should be done with these resources. So then we have conflicts again and we must find a solution to this problem. How do we solve problems that otherwise would be uh, unavoidable if we consider ourselves all to be owners of these, of these goods? And then we <coughs> come back to uh, the only person who has, so to speak, uh, a claim that is better justified than the claim of anybody else is the person who has, in first, has indeed been the first to connect his body to this specific uh, resource. So in short, we are back to these rules because only these rules are on the one hand uh, fulfill the criterion of being universalizable, that is, uh, everybody is treated according to the same rules. There are not rules that apply for one class and there's other set of rules applying to another class. And secondly, only these rules make it possible that mankind can in fact survive. Um, the alternatives, as we have seen, the alternatives are either not capable of fulfilling the universalization criterion, or they lead to human, uh, they lead to our uh, our death. We are left with um, we are left with these. Um, 
Now let me choose a different, different approach uh, to, to justify these, um, um, these first two uh, principles given that the uh, latter two are implied in the, in the first two. Um, and th this approach requires that I make you aware of another requirement that is necessary in order to have any type of ethical problems at hand. Um, so far I only pointed out that scarcity is necessary in order to have this problem of social order arise. But there's another requirement. We can, for instance, have a conflict with, uh, with an elephant. So an elephant comes into this room and tramples all the, uh, on all the tables and chairs and so forth. Uh, and we are mad as hell that he doesn't rec recognize uh, our property rights. Or we can have a conflict with a mosquito that sits, sits on my arm and without having any permission uh, peaks me all the time. Um, do we in this situation have a problem that we might call an ethical problem uh, in front of us? And the answer is no, of course not. This is just a technical problem. Um, why is it not an ethical problem? It is not an ethical problem because I cannot talk to the elephant. I cannot just say, look elephant, don't you know how to behave? Didn't your parents raise you in the right way? And all of it? Didn't you see that I was here first? And all the rest of it, it makes no sense. This, so I have to just learn how to deal with the elephant. Fence him in, shoot him down, whatever it is, put chains around him. Um, he is part of nature and I have to learn how to deal with him in the same way as, as I have to learn how to deal with whatever, uh, rocks falling from heaven uh, or floods or other nat natural events. Uh, and the same with the mosquito, uh, I solve the problem by simply uh, smashing, uh, smashing the mosquito. Uh, or also talking to him, just don't you get the point? Um, yeah, but obviously to no avail. So what is also necessary in order to have ethical problems is uh, that both entities that have a conflict with each other must possess a rationality. And expression of rationality, the sign of rationality is nothing else but the capability of both entities to engage in propositional exchange, to engage in a discussion. Um, if that is not possible, then we have no ethical problem. Then we only have technical problems in front of us. Um, now, given that all of these ethical problems that arise out of having conflicts with other entities must be, if they can be solved at all, must be solved in the form of argumentation, talking back and forth. And given the fact that talking back and forth, uh, being a proponent of a certain thesis and talking to an opponent, and the opponent talking back to the proponent, and the proponent then talking back to the opponent, since this arguing does not just consist of free-floating sounds, uh, but requires the use uh, of our physical body, of our vocal cords, of our brains, and so forth. Uh, in any discussion that we engage in, we implicitly admit the ownership, the property of each person in his personal body. Uh, if I would not recognize this, I would have no reason, no justification for me to open my mouth to begin with. And if I would not recognize the ownership of my opponent in his body, there would be also no reason for me to ever talk to him. Uh, and likewise, the opponent 
replying to my argument must take it for granted that I'm the owner of my body. Otherwise we would all have to be silent forever. But if we were silent forever, so to speak, then nobody can ask for any justification of anything. Um, as soon as we begin to talk, talk to each other, then and ask for justifications of any kind, then implicitly we must admit uh, our mutual recognition of our property in our own body. That is also what makes it possible for us to, uh, to agree on the fact that we have disagreed. Um, this mutual recognition of our um, own physical body. So this is what uh, Professor Hussmann uh, mentioned before. The right to be a self-owner cannot be denied at pain of self-contradiction. Anybody who would deny this would be involved in a contradiction. And so we can say no other ethic except this one, everybody is a self-owner, can be defended without being involved in a contradiction. All other ethics, all other proposals that people might make uh, do land you in a contradiction and are because of this, so to speak, from a rational point of view, untenable, uh, uh, untenable positions. Um, when it comes to the first, all, first use, first own rule, the appropriation of things outside of our body. Uh, the justification for this, again very briefly, uh, goes something like this. Um, we either can um, acquire property in other things um, by declaration, by simply saying I'm the owner of this sort of thing. This is by the way how governments acquire their property. Uh, they just stand around and look and say, oh, he, as far as the eye can see, this is what I claim to be mine. Um, or uh, we can acquire property uh, by specific actions. Now, if we could acquire property by declaration, then we run into fundamental problems again. Uh, because people can have different declarations. Okay? You declare, as far as the eye can see, that's all mine, and I say, as far as my eye can see, it's also mine. So then we are back at square one. There are still conflicts out there, and the purpose uh, that we, uh, uh, the purpose that we, uh, that we have in talking about these things is precisely to avoid otherwise unavoidable conflicts. So a rule like this, will not avoid conflicts, it will create, it will create conflicts. Um, whereas this rule, first use, first own, uh, has precisely the advantage that it ties a specific individual objectively with clear-cut signs for it to a specific resource, whereas no other person is objectively uh, uh, with visible signs connected to the same resource. So my claim to it is always better and can be objectively justified, whereas nobody else's claim to this resource can be objectively uh, justified. So this is the uh, explanation why only this type of rule, again, can without any contradiction accept it uh, as a fair rule of acting and no other rule has the same, uh, uh, can, cl can, claim, um, can claim, claim the same thing. Um, I want to add very briefly um, two, two little amendments to this. Um, um, to this rule, to these rules that I mentioned there. Uh, the, f the, first, the first thing I want to point out is that people can only have property that is 
uh, right of exclusive control over scarce resources um, uh, insofar these resources are described in physical terms. That is, I have property only in physical resources and I have only the right uh, to be free um, of interferences on the part of other people that, um, uh, that violate or harm the physical integrity of my property. Nobody has a right in the value of his property, just in the physical integrity of their property. If I would have a right in the value of my property, you can see immediately the absurd consequences that arise from this. So let's say I'm in the labor market, try to get a job, and then somebody else appears and tries to just get the same job. Now obviously the appearance of this other person uh, might lower my value in the labor market. Um, if this would be a violation of my rights, then I would be entitled, so to speak, to kill this guy off um, in order to get my value up to its initial level. And the other person would have likewise the right to kill me off in, in order to get his uh, value up to the level that he had before on, on the labor market. So nobody has a right to the value of his property. I'll give you another example. I, I have a grocery store and you open a grocery store next door from, from me, then the value of my grocery store might well fall. Um, even though n you did nothing to the physical integrity of my goods. Everything that was in my store before is still in my store. Nothing is damaged in my store. But the value of the goods that I have stored in my store um, goes down. Again, if lowering the value constituted an act of aggression, I would be entitled to attack you. And likewise, you would be able to attack me. We would be back at a situation uh, at square one. That is, we have to find rules that allow us to avoid conflict that otherwise uh, is unavoidable. So un unsatisfactory uh, solution. Um, only if physical damage occurs, and this physical damage then is combined with the loss in value, only then do we have a legitimate complaint and can speak of an aggression? Not if no physical damage occurs, but just a value drop uh, occurs. The second, uh, the second thing that I want to explain in addition is in order to decide who is right and wrong in various conflicts, we have to take the time dimension into consideration. Let's say I appropriate a piece of land and there's, I have no neighbors around. And now I build a chimney here and uh, smoke emanates from my chimney and uh, pollutes, pollutes the land around me. Um, and now somebody else comes later on and he establishes property in my neighborhood. And now he demands that I stop that um, uh, uh, my uh, production emanating smoke from my chimney. Does he have a right to do this? And the answer is no, he doesn't, because what he acquired was already dirty, uh, dirty land. And I have, by being there the first, acquired an easement. I can continue doing this. Um, he, nothing is taken away from him because from the very outset he acquired land that was characterized by the presence of some sort of smoke on the ground and so forth. And typically he would only have to have, would have to pay a lower price for this type of land because it is already soiled. Uh, if he wants me to stop this, he would have to pay me 
to stop it. On the other hand, let's say I'm here first and my land is clean and then somebody else establishes a factory next to me and then sends out smoke that lands on my, uh, on my property, then the situation is different. In that situation, I have an easement uh, for my land to be clean. Uh, he has indeed engaged in an aggression. He has deteriorated the quality of my uh, of my land. I acquired clean land and he makes it dirty, whereas this guy acquired dirty land, knew that he acquired dirty land, uh, and I can now stop him from doing this. I can just uh, take out an injunction and force him to stop it. Okay. So depending on who was there first, these types of conflict uh, are decided in a different way. Um, now back to this side. I want to briefly explain why these, these rules can also be considered to be rules um, that fulfill the criterion uh, of uh, Pareto superiority. Um, uh, re recall, because we cannot measure utility, um, and cannot engage in interpersonal comparisons of utility. We can only speak of an increase in social utility if at least one person gains and no other person loses in utility. Now, we can say that self-ownership uh, is indeed a rule that fulfills the criterion of Pareto superiority. Uh, because the alternatives, there would be always one person made worse off uh, at, and, uh, and one person would be made better off at the expense of someone else. So this would definitely, a system of slavery for instance, would definitely not fulfill the criterion of Pareto superiority. Um, first use, first own the principle. Um, the person who acquires something for the ver fir very first time that was previously unowned is certainly made better off by doing this, otherwise he would not have done it. At the same time, he does not take anything away from anybody else because everybody else had an opportunity to acquire the same things, but they didn't. They demonstrated that something else they consider to be more valuable than the appropriation of this. No good has been taken away from anyone else by me being the first one to appropriate another good. One person gains, no one loses. Pareto superior move. The third one, uh, producer owns um, the product. Of course the producer gains. Um, if the producer does not physically damage through his production act, the pro property of anybody else, then we can say one person gains, everybody else in the world still has exactly the same goods that they have before, so this is also, also Pareto superior. And finally, uh, acquisition through voluntary transfer. A voluntary transfer is always characterized by the fact that both transferring partners uh, expect to gain from the exchange, uh, and the exchange does not in any way diminish the amount of goods available to other people. It does not affect the properties that other people have at all. Two people gain, nobody loses. This is also Pareto superior. Um, now I want to come to um, some, uh, some modern alternative to these types of rules that have been developed um, in the so-called um, Chicago law and economics tradition. I call this, so to speak, the classical view about how property rights are acquired, uh, what, consider, what is considered to be correct behavior, what is considered to be criminal behavior, and so forth. And I trust that uh, in your daily life, uh, 
except of course for knowing that governments don't act according to these rules, but private individuals acting in their private lives do of course follow these rules and if they don't follow these rules they typically know that they have done something that they should not have done. Um, now I come to, as I said, to the Chicago uh, view, which is, as you will see, a very different approach and a very dangerous, uh, dangerous approach um, at that. And um, I want to explain that by using an example. Um, and I have, when I talk about Chicago law and economics tradition, I have in particular in mind Ronald Coase and Richard Posner, uh, two of the most, Coase by far the most prominent man in this field, and uh, Posner his uh, atlatus. Um, and I want to use an example that Coase gives um, of a conflict I want to explain how this is solved, so to speak, in the traditional way and how he will solve it uh, instead. The problem is that he describes is something like, uh, um, goes something like this. Um, there is um, a railroad that emits sparks and these sparks burn down the wheat of an adjacent uh, farm. And uh, the question is now, uh, who, who is liable for the damage? Um, uh, should the, uh, should the uh, uh, railroad be punished or should the farmer be uh, forced to accept this sort of thing and so forth? Now how do uh, how does the Austrian, the traditional approach, solve this problem? Oh, yeah. For them, the question is, who was there first and who came later? Um, if the farmer was there first and had, so to speak, spark-free wheat, and then the railroad was built afterwards, and then the sparks burned down the wheat, then, of course, uh, the railroad would be held liable, would have to stop it, uh, or would have to pay compensation to the farmer. Otherwise, if the railroad was there first and admitted sparks, and then the farmer built his wheat field right next to this uh, railroad track, um, uh, then the decision would be, after all, the farmer uh, acquired property that was sparked instead of spark-free, uh, and he has no claim against the railroad owner. Um, he, if he wants to have his environment spark-free, would now have to pay um, the railroad to stop it. So depending on who was there first, the case would be decided either in favor of the farmer or in, uh, in, favor, of, um, in favor of the railroad. Um, it depends, so to speak, who was there first and who has acquired what type of easement. Um, now this is not the way Coes would solve this problem. And I'll read you what Coes says how to deal with this problem. He says, um, it is wrong to think of the farmer and the railroad as either right or wrong, as aggressor or victim. The question is commonly thought of as one in which A inflicts harm on B and what has to be decided is how should we restrain A? But this is wrong we are dealing with a problem of reciprocal nature. To avoid the harm to B would be to inflict harm on A. The real question that has to be decided is 
should A be allowed to harm B or should B be allowed to harm A? The problem is to avoid the more serious harm. Now, I want to translate that into a, some sort of slightly absurd, absurd example to show to you in a very drastic way what, yeah, what outrageous position this is. Um, I slightly rephrase uh, Coase's words here, just use a slightly different example. Um, so let's say we have the case where person A is raping person B. Okay. Then, according to Coase, we would not simply have to restrain A, the rapist. Rather, and now I quote him from the previous quote, rather we are dealing with a problem of reciprocal nature. In preventing A from raping B, harm is inflicted on A because he can no longer rape freely. The real question is, should A be allowed to rape B or should B be allowed to prohibit A from raping him? The problem is to avoid the more serious harm. Now you might think, isn't that easy to determine what the more serious harm is? But again, this is not that easy either. Um, imagine the following scenario. Okay? So A is a rapist, has been incarcerated for a long time, for 20 years. He hasn't seen a woman in 20 years. Okay? <laughs> B, on the other hand, is a professional prostitute. She is in the business of this sort of stuff. Um, now A rapes the professional prostitute. Now the question is, is more harm done to A by preventing him from raping the prostitute, or is more harm done to the prostitute um, by letting A rape her? Now the question is obviously a difficult one, right? Um, you see the perversity of this, uh, of this type of, uh, of thinking. Um, we might well come to the conclusion um, that uh, the rape was perfectly all right because after, after all, uh, more harm would be done to A if he would be prevented from uh, going on with his uh, activity. Uh, to under, underscore the absurdity of this position um, even more, let me give you some other marvelous uh, insights from this time from Mr. Um, from Mr. Posner. So Mr. Posner, for instance, says, and this is by and large the same idea as we find in Coase, he says, an act of injustice is defined as an act that reduces the wealth of society. And by implication, an act of justice is defined as an act that, re that increases the wealth of society. Now I want to give you a few, and he, he gives, for instance, one, one example, which sounds relatively harmless, and then I will give you a few more absurd examples. Um, so he says, for instance, suppose a polluting factory lowers residential property values in an area by $2 million but that it would cost the factory three million dollars to relocate. On this basis, the factory prevails. It can stay there. The residential property values are only reduced by two millions and relocation would take three millions. So if the purpose is to increase wealth in society, if this is just, then of course the factory should prevail, should stay there. Now change the numbers. Um, so if residential property values are reduced by three million dollars and relocation costs are two million dollars, uh, then uh, we would have to force 
the company to relocate because that would increase social wealth. Okay? Um, and if the situation changes in the course of time, then again, relocations might be necessary. Now I want to give you a few more ridiculous examples to show what evil consequences this view has on, uh, on law. Because it implies basically that people have no longer any stable property rights at all. That property rights become something that is flexible and can be reassigned depending on changing circumstances. So you have a wallet in your, in your pocket and I know that the plan that you have with the money in your wallet is to go out tonight and get drunk. Okay. I, on the other hand, uh, my plan is to use this money in order to make an investment uh, that will yield uh, tons of money. Uh, based on this criterion that just is what increases value, wealth, and injust is what decreases social wealth, it would be perfectly just for me to go to him, take his wallet out of his pocket and appropriate myself because after all he would reduce social wealth by drinking away his money and I would increase social wealth by uh, investing it um, in a careful way. And then let's say after three weeks I turn into a bum and he sobers up. Um, so then he can come back to me and say, now I'm robbing you of your wallet uh, because I have the feeling that you, through your actions, will reduce social wealth, but I'm uh, a healed, uh, healed man and I will invest this money in a careful way. So now the wallet belongs to me all of a sudden again. Um, to give you another beautiful example here from, from Kosner himself, um, again, always keep in mind, whatever reduces wealth is an act of injustice, needs to be punished. Whatever increases wealth is a just act that needs to be promoted. So he asks us, uh, we may, he considers the case of Henry Ford and thinks about what would be the situation if Henry Ford, the industrialist, had decided instead of becoming the Henry Ford that we know him to be, to become a Trappist monk, that is withdrawing from, from life, so to speak. And then he, he writes, we may be reasonably confident that the American people would be poorer if Henry Ford had decided to become a Trappist monk rather than an automobile manufacturer. Thus, would it have been justified to enslave Ford so that he would indeed become the Ford that we know instead of a monk? Surely, if wealth maximization is just, and uh, Ford then would have no property right in himself. We would have to enslave him take him out of this cloister there and put him behind um, the uh, assembly line so that he finally acts in a just way rather than unjust withdrawing from society and reducing the potential social wealth. Um, and then he says this, if there is a taste for pure solitude, that is, for seclusion unrelated so, to, so, uh, to social interaction. This is a selfish emotion. So if you just want to just be alone and not have any dealings with people. Solitary activity benefits only the actor. Work, on the other hand, confers benefits on others. There is thus a sense in which the person who works is unselfish while the individual who retires from the world reduces his contribution to the wealth of other people in society. So what's the consequence of this? All retired people should be enslaved um, so that they contribute, continue to contribute to the wealth 
in society because if they just simply retire from society, they are acting in an unjust, in an unjust way. Um, lastly, a quote that indicates something about the philosophical sophistication of Richard Posner. Richard Posner is uh, one of the most highly ranking judges in the United States. In the Sixth dis District Court is always handled as a potential Supreme Court judge. And uh, I want to read you just a little quote that shows you um, why some of these people obviously have some screws loose. Um, so he says here on rights in general, absolute rights play an important role in the economic theory of the law. But when transaction costs are prohibitive, the recognition of absolute rights is inefficient. Property rights, although absolute, are contingent on transaction cost and subservient or instrumental to the goal of wealth, wealth maximization. Now, in plain language, that, he's, that, that says property rights are absolute, except when they are not. Um, now, this Chicago view that just is what increases wealth um, and uh, what decreases wealth is unjust um, does not even guarantee that wealth in society will indeed be maximized. Because you realize this rule, of course, implies that property rights are variably assigned. Um, they can be given to you if you promise certain things. They can be taken from you uh, if you don't promise certain things. But if property rights become variable instead of being fixed once and for all, then, of course, the amount of investment and saving will dramatically reduce as compared to a situation when people are secure in their private property rights. That is, their rule will not even accomplish the goal um, that, uh, that they set themselves. And lastly, uh, let me make you aware that to a certain extent these Chicago perversities have already in a drastic way affected American jurisdiction. Um, there were numerous cases in recent months, recent years, uh, where private property owners uh, were expropriated by local governments and so forth and this property was not used in order to whatever build roads or so. This property was then simply transfer, transferred to another private property owner with what justification? The justification was property owner one, whom we expropriated, paid only such and such amount in taxes, and if we take it away from him, and give it to person Y or Z, person Y or Z will pay us a significantly higher amount of taxes. And that was sufficient reason enough in order to eliminate pre-existing private property rights. Um, I challenge you again to think about what detrimental effects this will have in the long run on the accumulation of wealth in society if no private property owner can be sure anymore in his private property rights but must, um, uh, must be afraid that at any moment his property will be taken away from him because there is somebody else available who makes more money out of it and accordingly is able to pay higher taxes with his property than the other person did. This, this has, the, the amazing thing is that people like Coase and Posner are considered to be free marketeers. Um, what they do 
especially because they are labeled as free marketeers, is in a way far more dangerous than what communists do, because at least communists are honest uh, in what they, are, what they have in store for us. And these people pretend that they are advocates of free markets and in fact advocate uh, some side of morals that is indistinguishable from the morals that communists advocate. Thank you very much. Uh, the criticism that I often hear against the rules that you that put on board, because I use them myself, is against rule number two uh, on, on, on the original appropriation of, uh, of property and property rights as such uh, from people who advocate a more sort of user rights, you know, the, where, where the right of property um, ceases the moment you start using things. And they argue that, that that does not violate the universal principle because this is a rule that applies to everybody and all property or all <laughs> things. Is there a logical argument against that or purely a utilitarian argument? No, I think only if you openly declare that you abandon the property, then it would be available to other individuals. But what is wrong with acquiring a certain piece of land and then preserving it, let's say, as a nature park, for instance, um, that is not, trans not, trans not to continue transforming it in any other way, but just leaving it as a nature preserve. Only if you abandon it, declare, I have abandoned it, then other people would have a right to it. I mean, otherwise, look, the, the absurd consequences are something like this. Um, you, um, you have a house and you have a sofa. Most of the time, you don't sit on the sofa. Um, so does that mean that anybody can now come and say, no, yeah, the sofa is not used right now, so I'm just sitting on his sofa. Uh, you go on vacation. Uh, your house is empty. Uh, people say, you know, the house is empty. This is, of, this is of course, uh, free uh, and ready for occupation by other individuals. If this would be a right, again, there would be no stability of private property rights at all. Because at all times, almost all the things that, that you consider your property are not used. Right? I mean, your car is not used right now. Um, it, Practically, practically everything that you consider your property except your, your suit and your pants and your shoes that you just make use of at this moment, all of that is abandoned. Um, that would mean we have chaos inst instantly. N nobody would own basically anything except those things that they carry around. Everything else would be just ready to be grabbed by anyone who feels like grabbing it as long as it is not currently m being made use of. So it would have absolutely absurd consequences. Now you get, get me into difficulties here. Um, now this would have to be carefully investigated. Now my own investigations um, that tell me uh, that um, most, most of the land that uh, Israel claims has been stolen from the Arabs. Um, they, have no claim to, they have no claim to it. They were just simply expelled. Um, it is a question whether that can be rectified right now. 
Uh, look, I have no, I have no doubt, for instance, uh, that uh, most uh, uh, millions of Germans have uh, property rights to land in Czechoslovakia or in Poland. Um, they can show titles that go back sometimes hundreds, hundreds of years, and they have not received it back. That's a matter of prudence. We, we, not, not all injustice can be rectified. Um, but it is important to recognize that injustices have been done. Um, my parents have been expropriated in East Germany. When the German, uh, my, my mother was an uh, uh, East Albion Junker. Um, so, so when Germany was uh, reunited, uh, then we thought we would get our property back. Um, we had titles to the property that extend to before the, the Thirty Years' War, which is long because most of the documents in Germany were destroyed during this period of time, so very few people can trace their property titles um, before that. We could just prove all the monies that had been paid and so forth. Um, the land was not given back to us. The land was, was taken over by the West German government, uh, who basically continued, finished, so to speak, what the Soviets had begun in 1946. Um, the property was valued at several million dollars, um, and uh, we have received, after uh, 15 years of waiting, 100,000 euros as expropri as uh, compensation for this. Um, people went to the Supreme Court, uh, said the, the uh, Constitution in Germany guarantees uh, private property rights, and they said, yes, they do, um, but not at market value. Um, so we will, give you a compens we will give you a compensation and, uh, and just be happy with it. Um, now, again, you see, like, I feel that a grave injustice has occurred to my family. I think I would be entitled to shoot Helmut Kohl, who was in charge at that time, dead. Um, but it would not be a wise thing for me to do this. You know, I could not give lectures like this for very long anymore if I would, uh, if, if I would take justice in my own hand. But of course, he has deserved it. Um, out of prudence, I just let it go. I'm a generous person, um, but he deserves it. And um, yes, the situation in Israel is similar. Yes, grave injustices have occurred there. There existed very few Jews at the time, far more Arabs. Um, uh, there was, there, with terrorist means, the Arabs were expelled and are still not allowed to return to the place where they had, were born and all the rest of it. Uh, whereas every Jew from all over the world who has never touched Israel is allowed to come according to the law of returns to these places and occupies places to which Arabs have titles and can show it. This is, of course, unjust. Um, there are many injustices in the world and we cannot rectify them all, but we have, we have a theory that allows us to determine uh, there something bad has happened, there something bad has happened. There are also many bad things that have happened where we cannot trace it back. Um, the longer these injustices, the, the longer the time span is that these injustices have occurred, the more difficult it becomes to point out who the legitimate claimant is. Um, for instance, the expropriations that took place, let's say, in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Germany and so forth after 1945, <coughs> many of the documents exist still. Um, the expropriations that took place in, in 1917 in Russia, most of those documents have disappeared. Um, and of course, whoever claims that he is a legitimate owner has a burden of proof. 
Um, first, we, we take the position whoever occupies a place right now uh, has prima facie, uh, is prima facie the owner of it. Uh, unless somebody else can show that he in fact is not the right owner. And the longer you go back in time, of course, the more impossible this sort of thing becomes. So for instance, in, in America, this is also a big issue about Indian rights. Um, what, has done, what did people do to the Indians? Um, there existed legitimate transfers, that is, people really bought land from the Indians. Uh, there existed cases where the Indians were expelled from their land. Um, there existed cases where the Indians did not really own the land. They were just hunters and gatherers. They were just roaming around and did not even have a concept of property right in land. Uh, so that you cannot claim that anything has been taken away from them if somebody would have settled there. These issue, issues are enormously complicated um, and because they are back uh, yeah, 150 years or so, uh, it is practically impossible uh, to solve individual, uh, individual claims in a just way. that uh, retiring Hosna would uh, increase uh, social wealth, so maybe you should think about that. Yeah, yeah, I think that well, would increase social wealth also. Yeah. I, I have, I have uh, uh, two questions. Um, first, uh, the, 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 the thing about the, the, you know, building a factory next to a, a property and, and, and polluting uh, the, the, the property that was there first, isn't it, isn't it, uh, it, it, uh, does it matter uh, if I uh, pollute or plant flowers? I mean, isn't it just uh, enough that there's a physical alteration of your property? Is that, isn't that, uh, that, that, that constitutes a, a break of property rights? If just... No, yeah, it, obviously we must have a, a, a conflict, otherwise we would not have no decision has to be made. In, in the case of planting flowers, no conflict might break out unless the people really hate the type of flowers that you planted at the place. Um, but, um, but again, in, but the principle of solving these conflicts is always the same. And have you established an easement to do this by your previous actions? Or haven't you established an easement? Uh, if you have established an easement, then latecomers cannot complain about the fact that these activities have been taking place before. Um, if you have not established an easement, then latecomers, of course, uh, can complain if all of a sudden you begin now to pollute uh, or uh, uh, throw garbage over the wall or plant flowers that they absolutely can't stand. Thank you for clearing that up. And, and I'm, I'm, I've heard people um, it, it, uh, defending intellectual property rights from the, from the same rules as you use uh, there. Could you, could you touch briefly on that? V uh, very briefly. I, I should uh, make you aware of a of a great article by a friend of mine, uh, 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 Stefan Kinsella, who is actually a patent lawyer but doesn't li believe in patents. Um, it, and that article has appeared uh, two or three years ago in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, which is available on the net at uh, www.mises.org. And you could, if you just type in Kinsella, you would get his five or six articles that he has published in the journal and from the title you would clearly recognize that it deals with intellectual property rights. But let me say this much at this point. Um, recall I said um, property rights uh, can only be acquired in things 
that are scarce and only because they are scarce are conflicts over their use possible. Now ideas, once they have been thought, are no longer scarce. If I think the same idea that you think, I'm not taking anything away from you. You can still think exactly the same thing as, uh, as before. Nothing is diminished uh, on, your, um, on your part. Thoughts are, once they have been thought, free goods. Um, and conflicts over them are impossible. Um, uh, again, imagine what the consequences would be if we would not accept this view. Um, so then we would, then we would conceivably owe, uh, owe royalties to the widow of, uh, of Aristotle uh, until the end of our lives. I mean, it's not even the widow has not survived up to this town point either, but whatever Aristotle's, uh, little Aristotelis uh, run, around, run around there in, in Greece, um, they might still collect uh, money whenever we say uh, A and non A cannot exist at the same time. I mean, I think I would consider that to be utterly unfair because I can think this idea myself also. I would not have needed Aristotle to come up with this idea, but nonetheless, he was the first one to write it down. Um, so, and this is, this is the, same, the same thing. I mean, you are all free writing on my on my ideas, um, I could just collect royalties now from, from all of you because uh, I used some words that you might not have heard before. Uh, I might have expressed some thoughts uh, that, you, that you will repeat that you thought funny or not so funny um, and uh, you will be now eternally indebted to me. Um, I should just throw, throw you all in, into debtor's prison unless you just uh, deliver your uh, weekly or monthly or uh, annual royalties to me. So keep that please in mind. <laughs> in that case, uh, thank you all again for your patience and uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to to be here, and I think I speak also for Guido Hussmann, who is already drinking someplace, I assume. Um, but I'm sure that, oh yeah, he is smiling from outside. Um, so I think he also regards it as a pleasure that we were here. Thanks again.